Hello friends, today we're going to be talking about justice as we continue our series, Grow. Last week we talked about hope and what that means for us as people of God, how we can be sources of hope in our world, how we can plant it in us, and how we can grow it in the world around us. Today we're going to be looking at justice. On May 25th, almost everyone in the world now knows that George Floyd passed away at the hands of a police officer. It was ugly brutal, unjust, and wrong. In fact, watching the video was soul-wrenching. A friend of mine shared recently that they were struggling because the video was being played again and again, and it was hard to watch it just once, much less over and over again. It's a reality that's been seared into the conscious and the hearts of Americans. And understanding a story that's been played out before us that has opened eyes and hearts and minds to understand. And so I need to say some things this morning. On Wednesday, Pastor Brenda and Pastor Kathy and Matthew and I had a conversation that was 40 minutes long in which we discussed many of our feelings and thoughts about the issues of the past two weeks. You can go there if you want to see a fuller conversation about that. It's on Facebook. But I just want to say some basic things today. First, what happened was an ugly display of humanity. It was disgusting and wrong. Second, racism, both systematic racism, in which we develop systems that oppress and that keep people powerless, and personal racism are wrong. They're sinful. God declares them such all over scripture. Third, the peaceful protests that broke out as a result were beautiful. Watching people arm in arm to stand up to say this was wrong. Fourth, violence is wrong. And the looting and the rioting that we've seen in some places is wrong. And I've seen people stand up in poor communities and talk about how the results of this are that they will lose vital connections and stores and resources that they need in their community. And they've resented the fact that others have destroyed that for them. Finally, the loss of life from protesters to police as a result and a fallout of these behaviors is also wrong. It's damaged and hurt and continued the loss that began with the horrific things that happened to George Floyd. And so today I want to look at justice. I want to look at what it means from a biblical standpoint and injustice itself, what we can do about it, and how we should respond in this world. Reverend Dr. Bernice King, who is the daughter of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., said in January, some important statements that I think help guide our understanding of this moment. She said, Humanity engaging each other as a human family in our world house greatly depends upon us understanding our interrelatedness and interconnectedness. Humanity engaging each other as a human family in our world house greatly depends upon us understanding our interrelatedness and our interconnectedness. And she goes on to say this, as daddy said, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. Our survival hinges on us recognizing this. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied together in a single garment of destiny. Our very survival hinges upon us recognizing this. What she said in those statements comes grounded in Scripture, in the tradition that God gives to us and in what God's saying to us. The Scripture that we're going to look at today is from Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 and 24. As we look at it, you may say to yourself, why did you pick the Scripture, Pastor? This seems so out of place. 
But the story and the lesson that Jesus is trying to tell here is so critical. I'm going to tell you up front what Jesus is trying to say so that as we read it, you can begin to understand what he's trying to get at in this passage. He's trying to say that if we learn to practice a personal spiritual holiness that never reaches others, we've missed what God is trying to do. Here's the scripture in Matthew chapter 23. Here's what Jesus says. And he's speaking to religious leaders, priests, and law, people who know the religious law. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, hypocrites? For you are careful to tithe. The tithe is a spiritual act of giving. It's a spiritual practice tied to a spiritual discipline of giving that teaches you how to give the way God wants you to give. The tithe, for you... For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income of your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. And here's what Jesus is trying to say. You've come to understand the importance of giving, and I've asked you to give on a regular basis a spiritual discipline, the tithe, that was 10% of their income, grounded beginning in Deuteronomy as an act of spiritual discipline. And it was meant to teach them that what they had was God's and that they were to use it to bless their world. And he says, you've learned so well how to tie to the church. You give of everything, including your tomato plants and your basil. But you've missed why I wanted to teach you this in the first place. So that you would learn to give so that others would be blessed through justice and mercy, and faith. Put a different way, Paul in the book of Galatians says this. This is my favorite verse. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. For me, that captures so much. The only thing, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. John Wesley believed that our personal holiness must flow into our social holiness, that others need to be blessed by it. Our interconnectedness, our interrelatedness demands it. And so there are so many stories in Scripture that exemplify justice and what it means, beginning with Moses leading the people out of slavery in Egypt into a promised land, with Samson helping the people who are oppressed by the Canaanites, with Esther, as people were again threatened with violence and death, and Isaiah, who talks about justice and the importance of justice, of Amos speaking about justice flowing like waters, of Nehemiah, and of Ezra, the priest and the politician, who together helped lead people out of a place of captivity, and back to Israel to be free and to live out their life and their faith. And so the stories of Scripture are filled with stories of justice and writing injustice. And God is very clear about some of the things that he considers justice and injustice. Beginning in the Ten Commandments, God tells us, In the ninth commandment, you may not remember the order or even all of them, but the ninth commandment says that you are not to bear false witness. In other words, you're not to lie to get someone else in trouble or to put them in a bad place, jail or any place else that's wrong. Because that's a level of injustice that God cannot stand. Getting ahead by intentionally putting somebody else behind, falsely representing them. It's so important to God that he put it in the Ten Commandments. And as you look, not only the specific places where God speaks about injustice, but the imagery that goes along with it helps us to understand it for today. It's so important. He says that injustice happens when there are unequal scales, scales you to measure things. For many of us, we see that justice is is pictured as a metaphor by in America by a woman who's blindfolded and holding scales that rightly determine right and wrong. God says that improper scales, rigged scales, scales that, that, are, that, that, that benefit one over another are wrong. 
And he means that both in the marketplace and in the, and in the area of law. And sometimes scales have been rigged to benefit one group or one race or one uh, population over another. And he says that's unjust, that's wrong. He talks about um, a fair judicial system all over scripture. He talks about judges not being able, and, and politicians not being able to be bribed or influenced. That just because you have money doesn't mean that you should have a different form of justice. We see that even today, don't we? He talks about caring for people with less power. All through the Old Testament prophets and Jesus himself declared that we need to watch out for those who have less power. And, and he named he named people that in that society had that situation. He talked about the poor, the fatherless, the widows, the orphans. He talked about how those particular people, because of the rights and abilities and, and financial wealth given to them or lack thereof in those cultures, left them with less power. And that we had to be advocates for those that we had to stand up for when injustice happened because they could be powerless to do that for themselves. He also talked about how justice and mercy go together. They're both a part of the character of God. Both justice and mercy are a part of who God is. Now, right now, we may not want to think about that because right now, as we look at the George Floyd situation, what we want to demand is justice. But in truth, God declares that justice and mercy should come as a pair how that plays out becomes different in different situations. But we have, before when we've looked at justice, seen injustice and said there needs to be more justice. And we've looked at people who have committed wrongs and also said there needs to be mercy. And so for us, these two things, we have to work out as a society. What do they mean and how do we live that out? What is God asking of us? And so I want to suggest four actions that we can take that are very practical Four things that we can live out that are so important to us. The first thing that I want to suggest to you that you can do now, practical things that will make a difference in our world, is to learn. As we get older, we think that we know a lot. We've grown up, we've matured, we've seen many things, and, and we've come to believe that our own perspective is the right one. But of course, in truth, what we know is that a hundred different people can see the same thing. And if they were to retell what they saw, there'd be a hundred different stories because we see it from our own perspective, don't we? And to take the time to learn about how other races and cultures, their story and how they've lived and, and how that's happened throughout history is critical for us. To get a different sense of perspective is key. To be... Lifelong learners is so critical to being open to what God wants to do in us and in our world. There are so many books, podcasts, YouTube videos, and places that you can easily go to learn about others. We need to do that. The second thing that we need to do is listen. Here's how I put it earlier this week in a conversation with some folks. I think we need to lay down our story so that we can hear another story. Here's what I mean by that. Each one of us has a lens through which we see the world. And when someone else begins to tell their story, we automatically begin to assess the rightness or the wrongness, the goodness or the badness, how we feel about it. And sometimes it's important for us to lay down our story and just listen, to lay aside judgment and evaluation, to listen to the point of understanding to come to hear what they have to say. When we're done and we've reflected on it, we still may come to a conclusion that we do not agree with them. But if we don't listen up front, we will never have the opportunity to grow the way that we could, to connect the way that we could, to understand the way that we could, which is so critical. And that's really tied to the third thing, which is love. We are called to love in this world. You've heard me say this a thousand times, but I'll never stop saying it. Because when it all comes back, Jesus said the two most important things are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And he broadly expanded the definition of neighbor and who neighbor is to a point of making us feel uncomfortable. 
That love is so critical. It's foundational for the interrelatedness and interconnectedness that Bernice talked about. And I want us to really understand that by asking a powerful question. It's an uncomfortable question. It's a question that we may come to different answers on, but we need to ask it anyway. When we look at what's happening in our world, I think we need to ask the question, is that something Jesus would do? Is that something Jesus would do? We may not all understand Jesus in the same way, so we may come to different answers, but we should ask the question anyway. Would Jesus kneel on the neck of George Floyd until he died? Would Jesus link arm in arm with protesters? Would Jesus loot and riot? Would Jesus kill others? Would Jesus listen? Would Jesus hear out another person's story? How would Jesus love in these moments? This week, when I ask a friend the question, would Jesus kneel on the neck of George Floyd until he died? They said, that very question just makes me sick. I said, I know, me too. The imagery of it is hard to even picture. And it's meant to. For us, we were asked as followers of Jesus Christ to become more like Jesus. If it's easier and clearer for you to ask the question, would love do this, then ask it that way. But we need to pause and ask those questions today. We need to ask, how do I love? Where do I love? Who do I love? Who's God asking me to love? The foundation for justice, the very foundation for justice is found in the notion that God created all of us. All of us. He created all of us. And in creating us, he created us all as his children. The foundation for the way that we treat each other is grounded in that and that because God loved all of us, he calls us to love as well. We cannot forget that. As hard as that is to do, we cannot forget it. It's the bedrock of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And he calls us to love, not just those we like, not just those we understand, not just those who think like us, not just those who have the same story. but everyone. Finally, the last thing, we need to act. We need to act. And love will call us to act in different ways. And this is what's so important about what Reverend Dr. Bernice King said. The interrelatedness and interconnectedness of us will naturally move us to justice. The love that we have for people will naturally propel us to justice. Last summer around this time, my family and I took a trip to Thailand. We went to see my sister who's a missionary at an orphanage there, my sister Sarah. She and her husband and their daughter Gabriella have committed their lives at this point to going and to being with a group of kids, some of whom were former soldiers, and helping them who have little to no family in this world to grow up and to be a Christian, um, fully healed, educated young men and women. And so we went to see her this past summer, my wife and my three children. We spent nearly 10 days in Thailand. That alone was exciting for all of us. None of us had been to Thailand. And in that process, my kids got to spend a lot of time with kids from the orphanage. They played soccer. They literally took a hike into the jungle together without us. They played cards. They talked. They laughed. They sang. They connected. And they are still friends. Through social media, through Facebook, they still hold that friendship. Their hearts have become connected in ways that we could have never expected and deeper than we could have hoped. So recently... When we went and talked to the kids, our children, about beginning to part ways with some of their toys and books from their childhood, they were reluctant. 
And so I went to my wife and I said, I think, I think we can meet a need and help our kids at the same time. And she said, what are, you th- what are you thinking? And I said, I think it would be a beautiful thing if we went to our kids and asked them to make a list of everything they're willing to sell and give all the money, send all the money to the kids at the orphanage in Thailand who need food and clothing and books and all kinds of things, including just toys and treats that come with being a kid. And the moment that I suggested that anything they were willing to sell and all the money that was raised would go to Thailand, it changed something. And suddenly the list grew long. And we've begun the process of doing that. I didn't have to ask them. I didn't have to force them. There were no fights. The motivation to give to their friends who had less in a situation where they were powerless across a different race in a different country had grabbed their hearts and they wanted to act. And as soon as there was an avenue to do that, there was a big yes. And so there's a a wad of money on a refrigerator that grows as we sell stuff. And we're going to send it over to them with great joy from our family. We've set a goal. Because my kids, as soon as they had an avenue to love and to bless and to deal with injustice and lack and poverty, as soon as they had the ability to reach out to kids that didn't have the same as they did, and they had a deep connection to them, it was easy That kind of interrelated and interconnectedness moves the heart to respond to injustice, to help and to love and to care and to listen, to learn. And so I want to pause and ask you, are you thoughtfully developing an interconnectedness? Are you considering how you can learn during this time, how you can listen, how you can love, how you can act. This is a moment. But as my friend Pastor Brenda says, this is just a moment. What we need is a sustained response. A willingness to love, not just in a week or a month, but moving forward in a different kind of way. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me and to seriously consider what that means for you. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your goodness toward us, for your grace and your mercy, as well as your justice. Help us to grow justice in your world. We may be called, you may ask of us to do that in different ways, You may have to grow things in us. You may have to reveal things to us that we repent of. You may have to open our eyes to see things about ourselves that we have not yet seen, to hear things in others that we have not yet heard, to bring us a different understanding of our world. Lead us, Holy Spirit, into truth and help us to be your people who live to demonstrate our love and our faith in this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Pray for our nation and for healing. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, a shelter from the stormy blast in our eternal home. Most merciful and wise God, we come before your throne to say thank you while acknowledging that we are living in a world that does not make sense all the time. Times, dear God, of natural disasters, pandemics, hate crimes, and unconscionable injustice and violence. As we face these uncertain times in our nation and the world, O oh God, enter into our sorrows, our worries, our addictions, financial burdens, fears, and injustice. Fill us with your grace, hope, and joy abundantly. Turn each home into a place of peace, unity, and love for one another. Renew our hearts and minds to seek the knowledge of your mercy and love. Help our souls to have a mind to be united in insistent prayer. For we are comforted by the knowledge that you alone are our Savior and Lord and the ultimate master of life. We trust our nation to your loving care, Lord. Send your spirit to touch our hearts of the nation's leaders. Give them the wisdom to know what is right and the courage to do it. May your spirit move upon our hearts to be vessels of love, of peace, of hope, and of unity. Give us your light and your truth to guide us in 
our ways so that we may seek your will in our lives and impact the world around us for your kingdom. We ask this in all other prayers, but most of all, your love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. May God bless you and thank you.